are discussed in Isidus Levov. All right, so uh, I, I'll start by saying I, I really like this paper. Uh, I think it's a, it's a um, really, uh, I learned a lot from, from kind of reading through it. Um, and um, you know, as we all probably know, money is not the only thing that matters about a job. A lot of us in this room are academics, which is probably not the highest paying job we could have gotten. But as we all know, academia has a lot of really good attributes. Um, so clearly, this is this is this is an important thing to to many workers. Um, and I think Kathleen did a good job of describing the 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 problem with just kind of comparing wages across different jobs, just kind of looking at data on different jobs and and what they pay to try to infer how much these amenities are actually worth to workers. Because um, if you look at the data, you might see that a job with a lot of amenities um, actually pays more than a job with fewer amenities. Um, and that's because there's all kinds of unobservable characteristics of both jobs and workers that might be driving that. And we can't necessarily conclude from that that workers actually prefer jobs with fewer amenities. Right? You get the wrong sign. Um, a lot of the time. So we can't basically make apples to apples comparisons. Um, so what they've tried to do, and I think it's really clever, is, is used a survey-based approach to actually make apples to apples comparisons. They exp explicitly tell um, their respondents um, to assume that the, everything else about the job is identical except for the amenities that they vary. Um, so, so, and I've been told that I'm supposed to focus on the policy implications rather than the methodology. I do. Uh, but, but, but I am going to start with a couple of uh, questions or comments for the authors regarding their survey. I know that's about the methodology, but I think that also affects how we interpret the results um, in terms of the policy implications. Um, and then I'll, but I'll spend most of my time discussing kind of the broader uh, policy implications. So first of all, I think I'd be kind of remiss in my role as a discussant if I didn't kind of talk a little bit about the major drawback of, of uh, the stated preference survey approach. Um, and I think the, 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 the drawback is that you're relying on asking people hypothetical questions. And it's not always clear that when people are faced with a hypothetical question, they would make the same choice that they would make when you actually put them in that situation of having to decide between the two jobs. And I think one of the things that I would be most concerned about is, you know, jobs have lots and lots of attributes. And they've chosen to focus on 10. And when you're doing the survey, you kind of put those 10 attributes front and center and really focus workers, uh, respondents' um, attention on them. But you know, when you accept a job or when you're considering competing job offers, there are attributes that you might not pay so much attention to. Um, so I might be a little bit concerned about that. And uh, you know, I would be interested to see um, a little bit of uh, discussion of that, uh, a little bit more discussion of that uh, kind of in the paper. Um, but then again, given all the problems of the alternative approach of just kind of looking at the observational data, um, I think this is a completely reasonable way to go. And we learn quite a lot from, from doing this. Um, the second kind of comment that I want to make is, um, when the authors look at how workers value attributes in general by kind of adding up how they value each of the individual attributes, I wonder if there are interactions. Um, so for example, if the pace of work is relaxed, maybe the days off aren't as important. Um, or if you can set your own schedule, maybe the ability to telecommute becomes less important to you. Right? So if there are these interactions or complementarities between these attributes, I wonder if they could uh, kind of tease that out a little bit um, using, using their data, because that would be interesting to know. Um, the, the, the third sort of thing I want to point out um, or, or ask about is, I, you know, they've, they've explicitly told respondents to assume that all other features of the job are the same. Um, what I'd like to see a little bit more discussion of is to what extent um, respondents would actually do that, right? Because if I'm comparing a part-time job and a full-time job, um, am I really truly assuming that the part-time job comes with health insurance and a pension? I mean, that, that seems like a, uh, you know, so I'd have to make some kind of guess about that. So, so it, it would be interesting to, to know a little bit more about what might, uh, uh, what the, the respondents might have actually been assuming. And then finally, for older workers in particular, there's actually a realistic third option, which is not working at all. So I wonder how the addition of that 
not working retiring option might affect the comparison between the amenities and the, and the two job choices. Um, so now I want to talk, turn a little bit and talk about the, the broader policy implications of this work for uh, work at older ages. And I'm going to make uh, two points. And so, so the first one relates to work incentives in the social security program. Um, so I think the authors have done a really good job of showing that older workers tend to place a greater value on amenities than other workers. Um, so if we're talking about people who are extending their careers and working longer, um, working at these uh, part-time flexible jobs that don't pay as well, um, this has implications for uh, how those additional years of work translate into increased social security benefits. Um, in particular, working those additional years at the lower wage jobs probably won't increase social security benefits for someone who has already worked a 35-year career. Um, since Social Security is based on your top 35 years of earnings. Um, in this situation, if you're working longer at this kind of part-time flexible job with a lot of amenities and, and lower wages, um, the Social Security payroll tax becomes a pure tax on your earnings. You're paying the tax, but you're not really accruing any additional um, Social Security benefit. So, if this is how we would envision work at older ages or, or extending, extending working lives might look like, um, we might want to think about are there ways to tweak the benefit formula in Social Security to address that work disincentive that comes from the fact that once you hit 35 years, additional years of work at lower pay um, aren't going to do much for you in terms of increasing your Social Security benefits. Um, the second kind of broad policy implication I want to talk about is the demand versus the supply side um, in labor markets. The research at, on work at older ages has tended to focus on the supply side. So why do older workers make the labor supply choices that they do? Um, and that's what this paper does, and I think that's very important. Um, but there is also another side to the market. Um, so I think an important follow-up question here is why employers offer specific types of jobs with a specific set of attributes. Um, what prevents employers from offering the types of jobs that would enable older workers to extend their working lives? Um, and I think sort of more broadly, as a society, we face a question, you know, what is the best structure for, for jobs or career paths? And I think this is sort of a question of technology. So how should human capital be used in production? What arrangement is most conducive to uh, productivity or, or worker satisfaction? And there's kind of this caricature of, you know, this traditional career where you work full time at a relatively inflexible job and then you retire and then you're done. Um, and there's also kind of this caricature of the traditional family where you have one earner who works at that full-time job, full career, and then retires and they're done. Um, but more recently, that standard arrangement or that, that caricature has not been working well for, for a lot of people, including women, including people who might have maxed out their utility from income and are looking to improve their lives along other dimensions. And for this conference, for, for older workers who are living longer and healthier lives, might want to work a little bit longer, but with a more flexible um, uh, work work arrangements. So, you know, we're kind of, I think, seeing some technological change in, in how jobs and careers are structured. Information technology makes some of this possible, um, for example, by allowing telecommuting um, and developments like the gig economy, where it might be possible for an older worker um, to extend their working life through flexible part-time employment as a rideshare driver, for example. So we're seeing some of that. Um, but I, and I think the important policy questions here are, you know, what is the role that policy plays in this type of change in how uh, careers and jobs are structured? Um, and then the other policy implication is that we probably need some more research on the demand side of this in addition to the, the supply side. So why is it that employers offer particular types of, of jobs and, and career paths with, with different, different amenities? Um, so I'll stop there. I guess I have about a minute left. So. <laughs>